<laughs> Made a fool out of himself like we just like he did at Antietam last fall. Maybe he told some stories or made laymen sing some more rough songs over the graves of the soldiers. <laughs> Lincoln. All I ever hear is Lincoln. But it isn't true about Antietam. I can hardly imagine the president... But McClellan was there, wasn't he? And if Lincoln didn't do what everybody said he did, wouldn't McClellan have denied it? Look, every paper said that Lincoln was going to make a stump speech at the cemetery. Well, Phil would come with that mail and them papers. Lincoln shouldn't have gone anyway. Nobody wanted him. Says right here he was just sent one of them printed circulars. Shucks. Got one of them myself. And it wasn't much more than a week ago when they asked him to speak. Had to, most likely. Couldn't have the president there and not call on him to say something. Well, Chase didn't go, or Stanton. And General Meade wasn't there, either. He said the army needed him. Way I figure it out is this. Lincoln hasn't got a chance to be reelected, and he knows it. Chase wants to be president. And he wasn't going to Gettysburg and be the tail to a kite won't get off the ground. Meade didn't go because the president wasn't going to be there. He's still hot under the collar on account of what the president wrote him for letting Lee get away across the Potomac after the battle. There are a lot of people who think the president was right. The war might have been ended back there in July if Meade had followed Lee from Gettysburg. The Potomac was flooded, and Meade could have captured his whole army instead of allowing him 11 days to escape and then claiming he had driven the invader from our soil. The president was angry, and properly, I think. If we're fighting to preserve the Union, then the whole country is our soil. Anyway, it was Meade who won the battle, wasn't it? And what right did Lincoln have to say that if he'd gone up there, he could have whipped Lee himself? That's right. First, he wants to be a general and fight all the battles. And then he went to Gettysburg, like I said, to make a fool out of himself. If there's a wedding, Lincoln wants to be the bride. If there's a funeral, he wants to be the court. <laughs> <laughs> this man, Everett, is a old raider from what I hear, and mark my words, he must have made Lincoln look as woofless as a rebel shin plaster. <laughs> it's hardly fair to expect Lincoln to have competed with Edward Everett. Everett was the orator of the day, while Lincoln, so the papers say, was just to give a few dedicatory remarks. Everett is a great scholar. He's a noted Boston minister. He's been president of Harvard, Governor of Massachusetts, United States Senator, yes, an ambassador to England, and Secretary of State. Lincoln taught himself. Darn poor teacher, I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> I've never said Lincoln was a great man. Maybe he isn't. But he's come a long way by the light of a pine knot with a shingle for a blackboard, charcoal for a pencil, and a jackknife for an eraser. He taught himself to read and write and figure. And now he's president. But he won't be long. He's dead as a cock in a pit. Listen to this. Thad Stevens, Republican floor leader in Congress, when advised of the president's decision to speak at Gettysburg Cemetery, said, the dead is going to eulogize the dead. <laughs> That's it. The dead's going to bury the dead. <laughs> Here's Phil now. Slower my molasses. Hold your shirt on. You ain't even got the kettle on. Folks will be coming for their letters before you get a chance to read them. Let me have Ed Small's New York Times. That Phil Steele down at the depot this morning getting the train back to Washington. He was there. But it wasn't much of a speech. I want to say here exactly what happened. <laughs> All it says is, President Lincoln made a few remarks upon the occasion. <laughs> Old Everett spoke, Bill said, for an hour and 57 minutes. One of the greatest orations he ever heard. He's heard plenty of them in Congress. Then Lincoln spoke, before anyone knew what he was through. Bill saw one of them photographer fellers setting up his contraption, 
And before he could get his head under that shawl or whatever, Tis Lincoln had finished. Just like that. Didn't even get a picture of the president making the speech. <laughs> <laughs> Told you he'd make a fool out of himself. <laughs> we pass over the silly remarks of the president. For the credit of the nation, we are willing that the veil of ob ob O-B-L-I-V-I-O-N. Oblivion. I know you don't have to tell me. I'm willing that the veil of ob oblivion shall drop over them and they shall be no more re repeated or thought of. <laughs> <laughs> what paper is that? Harrisburg Patriot Union. Right nearby. Seems though they ought to know what they're talking about. The New York Tribune here says, the ceremony was rendered ludicrous by some of the sallies of that poor President Lincoln. Anything more dull and commonplace, it would not be easy to produce. <laughs> I suppose that'll be printed in England now and get them Britishers laughing at us. Guess that speech drug the last nail in old Abe's political coffin. Even Fletcher ain't got much to say now. No? But I'm thinking. What you thinking of? Great speech of your Mr. Lincoln? Four score and seven years. Maybe sounds better to a school teacher than 87 years ago. No, but here's a paper, the Chicago Tribune. They had a reporter there and he wired this. The dedicatory remarks of President Lincoln will live forever in the annals of men. <laughs> Look here, just what happened. Will you read it to us, Mr. Brown? The president arrived by special train on the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. Get down to it. Never mind. Let's all hear that. the speech. An amusing incident occurred when one of the military bands stopped to play in front of the home of Mr. Wills, where Lincoln was staying. Thinking he was being serenaded, the president came out and acknowledged the compliment, but declined to make a speech. He said, in my position, it is sometimes important that I should not say foolish things. He can't help saying them. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, Mr. Brown. The band went next door, where Secretary Seward responded with a graceful speech. The following morning, the procession moved shortly after 10 o'clock from Gettysburg to the cemetery, in charge of Marshal Ward Hill Lehman. There were several bands, including the 2nd United States Artillery Band of Baltimore. President Lincoln rode a horse which seemed much too small for him, and his appearance caused considerable amusement. When the procession reached the cemetery, there was another delay as Edward Everett, the orator of the day, was over a half hour late in arriving. After music by the band, Senator Everett delivered a notable address, which we are pleased to quote herewith. Standing beneath this serene sky, overlooking these broad fields now reposing from the labors of the waning year, the mighty Alleghenies dimly towering before us, the graves of our brethren beneath our feet, it is with hesitation that I raise my poor voice to break the eloquent silence of God and nature. Beautiful speech, men but it takes up seven columns. Although he spoke for nearly two hours, Senator Everett with his graceful form, his high clear voice, and his faultless gesticulation held his audience remarkably until the closing words of his eloquent peroration. It says in this paper, President Lincoln said in his speech, the world will little note nor long remember. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's one, so he was right. <laughs> Let's hear the rest of it, Mr. Brown. There followed a selection by the military band. At its conclusion, the Honorable Ward Hill Lehman arose and said, Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Four score and seven years ago, 
our fathers brought forth upon this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty, and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation, or any nation so conceived and so dedicated, can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of it as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here, have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they have thus far so nobly carried on. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, and that this government, of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth.